Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for Challenging History, Racism and City Development's Impact on Washington's Hello, everyone. Health Today. Thank you so much for joining. Sorry about that feedback. <laughs> totally forgot to silence the other computer here. But thank you just the same for coming and joining us. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge that the Washington State Historical Society is located on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people, who have stewarded this land for generations. We pay our respect to their elders, both past and present. So, as many of you might already know, this program is part of the Washington Stay Home Society. This is our ongoing series while we can't be together in person at the Washington State History Museum in Tacoma, but we still wanna keep bringing you all of this quality programming. You can follow the link that's on the screen there to see all of our other upcoming programming, again, still virtual for now. And then if you enjoyed the program, please do consider donating to help us continue this programming. That link is right there. That's also the link that you can use if you you want to become a member of the Washington State Historical Society, which comes with so many different benefits, and you can see them all online. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Columbia Bank, for making the Washington Stay Home Society programming possible. So thank you to Columbia Bank. Um, I also want to mention that again this evening, Len Bailly, who is our amazing programs facilitator, is joining us and facilitating the chat on Facebook. So as we go through the program tonight, feel free to add comments, ask questions, and those will make their way to us. So go ahead and chat it up and ask your questions. So let's get down to business. I want to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Rad Cunningham is a public health leader working to improve lives and reduce health disparities by building public health into policies, projects, and programs. His values are relationship building, evidence based on public health practice, and equity. He has over 15 years of public health experience and holds an MPH and MPA from the University of Washington. He has worked on public health programs in four countries on a wide range of acute, chronic, and health systems issues. Rad, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, Molly. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. And you're not doubled up like what I was trying to do here at the beginning of the program. <laughs> great. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you for the land acknowledgement. I appreciate that. And that um, you know, uh, we're talking about history and the impacts it has on public health, and um, that is that is a whole another subject that uh, would be worth digging into. So, maybe absolutely, how the impacts we're having um, on Native communities, of, you know, that our collective history is having, and uh, we kind of look at some some different pieces of our collective history. So, I am going to um, share my screen. Oh, okay. Uh, Okay, can you all see me? That looks great on our end. Okay. Um, let's see, I just gonna take one second. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, so I'm going to get started. <clears throat> so, uh, so as Molly said, my name is Rad Cunningham, and I work for the Washington State Department of Health, and I am a senior epidemiologist there. Um, I currently manage the climate change and health program, uh, and I previously managed our built environment section, where which is where I sort of gained a lot of the expertise that I'll be talking about here, um, and. I'm just going to move on to an outline. So I'm going to talk about some basic public health principles and community design basic concepts. Um, then I'm going to move on to redlining wealth and health, uh, and then transportation, the yellow book, and pedestrian fatalities. And then I'm going to kind of pivot a little bit and talk about epigenetics for a little bit, and um, going to end on some activities that are happening at the state level that are relevant to sort of, you know, well, most of the presentation will be about the past, but this will be a sort of about the 
uh, about the future and our opportunities. And those will talk about our environmental health disparities map, some upcoming legislation, and investing in a green future. So I, I kind of have a, my the stoplight was sort of my um, uh, my concept for an outline. So we're going to talk about redlining, which is a, you know about housing. We're going to talk about the yellow book, which is about transportation, and then we're going to talk about the opportunities of uh, the present that we have uh, as we invest in a green future. So public health 3.0. So this is a concept that's pretty um, well understood within the public health sector, but not probably very much so outside of it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about public health 3.0 and how we got there. So public health 1.0 is sort of like the very beginnings of like ger understanding the germ theory exists. And there's a famous story of a you know, the first, you know, potentially someone who may be considered the first epidemiologist, John Snow, uh, identifying a, a single water pump in London that was causing a cholera outbreak and turning it off. And so kind of starting there um, and going all the way up to the, you know, mid 1900s, uh, when we started seeing a shift from, um, you know, public health sort of being like charity care and um, infection control and starting moving into, you know, the the major issues uh, starting around mid to mid to late century were um, around chronic disease and you know outbreaks like HIV AIDS that required a different type of um, response. And so there was an influential report in 1988 called the Future of Public Health Report that sort of recommended bringing all of these public health programs together and sort of separating them from charity care and letting it be like an organization working just on prevention. And that. Uh, preceded the founding of the Washington State Department of Health by one year. So that, uh, and you know, many other uh, health departments around the country uh, were formed around that time. Um, and then we're moving on to, so then, you know, um, we started working in this chronic disease stuff and um, came to realize that a lot of the um, determinants of health are not really within the health sector, and that's kind of where public health 3.0 came around, is where we realized that, you know, in order to be effective, public health needs to be able to collaborate with, you know, planning and the housing sector, and they need to be able to collaborate with, um, you know, the transportation planners and, um, you know, early childhood education and, you know, finance, you know, all of these things, you know, influence health were completely outside of the realm of uh, public health practitioners. So this uh, collaborative work really came to a head. And Public Health 3.0 is important to me because it really shaped my career. So I feel like as uh, I ended up in a lot of the positions that our agency created in order to pursue Public Health 3.0. So I was a lead epidemiologist and I did like, you know, traditional epi stuff. I ran a surveillance system and we organized investigations of kids who had blood poisoning. And um, and they asked me to be a to move on and work on healthy community design, and so I jumped. I really, you know, loved the topic, loved the idea. But looking, starting working on it, I realized that you know, uh, community design and community planning are a whole other field, and it, like engaging with them was a challenge. And so, going from an epi like technical, like I knew, you know, like coding uh, data in R to like how do I develop a relationship with someone in the planning realm so I can have some influence on how, you know, we build healthy communities. And that was a big challenge. And not long after that, they reorganized the office again and created a built environment section. So sort of building upon that work, but instead of it being one, just me, it was me and some other people. And um, we were sort of branching out from the traditional environmental public health realms, which are, you know, clean air, clean water, and restaurant inspection, you know, that kind of Stuff, which is still important and we still do it, but um, we're trying to pivot to this broader, um, broader lens where we're looking at public health in a new way. And so uh, not long, not too much longer after that, so I was in the built environment position for a few years and then I moved on to uh, climate change and health section uh, where we're sort of managing a, another type of crisis that is super interdisciplinary and requires, you know, the ability to work with others um, and have a, Sort of renaissance kind of skill set in order to understand um, uh, how to how to see the whole well enough to make some progress. So that's enough about me and public health 3.0. Um, but one of the things I learned when I was um, 
starting to look into the planning sector is that the plan planners in many ways have a better take on what is on public health than public health professionals do. And that's because they, they see the environment that everybody lives in and understands that um, how, how to modify it for, for the better. And so one of the people I admired in that space was David Gosling. And he had a quote saying, for all our investment in the complexity of individual buildings on the one hand and an elaborate engineering infrastructure on the other, we have failed to achieve a humane and coherent physical setting for human life. And I think, you know, we have this kind of car supremacy culture where we kind of build um, cities around cars. Um, and then we kind of have lost the ability to house people and sometimes prioritize um, infrastructure in a way that is inconsistent with most of our values. Um, so a few just terms that I'm gonna be using a lot through the presentation that I want to define. Uh, one is social determinants of health. So these are life enhancing resources such as food supply, housing, economic and social relationships, transportation, education, healthcare, and whose distribution across the population effectively determines the length and quality of life. Um, and I think the, you know, the more I work in public health, the more I realize that social determinants of health are the, the primary drivers of our health outcomes, more so than, uh, healthcare or, you know, any of the work that we've done in our traditional public health um, realms. Another definition um, I have is for environmental justice, and this is from the Environmental Justice Task Force um, final report. Um, this was, this report was commissioned during the 2019 legislative session um, and sort of was the result of a broad outreach to community groups amongst a number of uh, state and local government agencies. So the definition is the fair and the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, and national organ, origin or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. This includes using an intersectional lens to address disproportionate environmental and health impacts by prioritizing highly impacted populations, equitably distributing resources and benefits, and eliminating harm. So that's a mouthful to read and probably to hear and even probably also to think, but we'll be kind of talking around this type, this basic concept through the whole presentation. So um, I want to do a quick chart of, of uh, health disparity um, here, which is just life expectancy by race. So from a health perspective, life expectancy is kind of the um, top of the, of the iceberg in terms of uh, health outcomes. So all the all other health data and measures kind of build into life expectancy. And uh, you can see that there's a significant disparity between um, men and women and between white men and white men and between white people and black people in the United States. And that this difference has more, you know, for better, you know, uh, has persisted through throughout time. And so all of the progress we've made on healthcare and better medicines and better interventions uh, that have been raising our life expectancy as a population have done nothing to address the disparity in uh, um, life years um, by race. And we're gonna look at some of the reasons why that might be tonight. Um, so that was an example of health disparity. So it's differences in the incidence and prevalence of health conditions and health status between groups based on race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender, disability status, geographic location, or a combination of these. And I probably left a few out, but you kind of get the idea that if you can meaningfully measure differences in health outcomes or health conditions um, by race, um, you, you have a disparity. And um, it's something we do a lot of thinking about how to address uh, at, at the health department. And health inequities are systematic and unjust distribution of social and economic environmental conditions used for health. So unequal access to quality education, healthcare, housing, transportation, uh, unequal employment opportunities, and discrimination based on social status. So that is my last definition, I promise, uh, but I kind of wanted to have that that found those are sort of the foundational concepts that I use in, in my work every day and are sort of foundational to um, what I want to talk about tonight. So one of the things that has influenced our 
our shifts towards public health 3.0 is this realization, you know, that um, clinical care is only determines about 20% of our health. And even health behaviors, which has kind of been the focus of traditional public health, only accounts for about 20% of our um, health outcomes. And, you know, genes and biology are even less. And, um, you know, the majority of what is really driving health are these social and economic factors. And um, I think I was, I was thankful for the opportunity to kind of look a little bit more deeply into the history of some of these issues tonight to kind of, you know, try and get a better understanding myself and to hopefully be able to communicate that with the, uh, with the audience. So I suspect you are all familiar with redlining. Um, there's a practice of sort of ranking neighborhoods in a way that um, determined where and what type of loans uh, people could get and that they were, um, done largely on, on racial lines. So I've got a quick video here, just a two minute um, uh, intro to red line that I wanted to share with you. In the Great Depression, homes have been foreclosed by the millions. And one of the ways that the federal government thought to get banks back into business was to develop a set of maps that showed what were seen as the best neighborhoods where their mortgages would be safe and the worst. So the age and the condition of housing was supposed to be the major criteria, as well as the income of residents. But the other criteria, and the one that's been most controversial and damaging in the long run, had to do with race. So in Seattle, any neighborhood that allowed residency by non-whites was automatically considered part of the red zone. Redlining told the banks that loans would be risky in, say, the central district. Mortgages were hard to get and families who were affected were deprived of the ability to accumulate wealth through property ownership over the generations. That legacy is still very much with us quite starkly today. Um, and Paired with redlining were these racist neighborhood covenants um, that, like, in, in addition to, um, you know, banks discriminating based on race and geography, um, uh, neighborhoods would have these covenants that would restrict um, people based on race. So I chose the Blue Ridge Community Club in Seattle because I remember going to swim meets there when I was a kid. and. Um, you know, in their foundation, you know, in their founding years, no Asiatic Negro or any person born in the Turkish Empire nor linear descendants of such person shall be eligible for membership in the club. And then in Laurelhurst Crest, no property in said flat shall at any time, directly or indirectly, be sold, conveyed, rented, or leased in whole or in part to any person not of the white race. And then uh, Lori Gan Manor, if I'm saying that right, in Tacoma, uh, no person of any race other than the white or Caucasian race shall use or occupy any building or any tract, except that, it, that this restriction shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race or domicile uh, or domiciled with an owner or tenant. So um, these covenants are still on deeds in many uh, neighborhoods in Washington state today, potentially on, on some of the deeds of uh, the audience members and um, legislation was passed you know, as late as 2018, uh, removing, they made it easier to remove racially restricted covenants. So I've got some, uh, you know, the Pierce County Auditor's Office um, uh, has four steps you can take if you do find it on your deed and would like to remove it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's the law across the state. So if anybody in any other county other than Pierce uh, found a racially restricted covenant on their deed, they would be able to, to remove it. But it's not 
fun. You, know, you have to find, you know, the recording date and original document containing the covenant and the tax parcel number and the legal description. And so it isn't fun, but, um, you know, dismantling racism wasn't meant to be fun. It's just something to do because um, it's the right thing to do. So this is one step you can take. And of course, these aren't enforceable um, since the Civil Rights Act, but they are meaningful. Um, they say something meaningful about our, about our collective. One thing that was touched on in the um, video we saw that I wanted to highlight a little bit more was the racial wealth gap. And so, um, you know, the average white family has about $171,000 in uh, net worth, median net worth versus 17,000 for black families. And, you know, a number of historical, you know, redlining isn't the only reason that it's happening, of course. there's um, there were a number of historical events like the Tulsa massacre of, you know, in 1921 of Black Wall Street, where, um, you know, a successful Black neighborhood was sort of decimated by um, white, by, you know, nearby white communities. Um, and wage distribution is another piece of the uh, wealth gap puzzle. So the wage disparities between white and Black wage earners has gotten worse between 2000 and 2018. So in 2000, black people made 79% of what white people did for similar for the same work. And in 2018, it's down to 73%. So the, it's trending in the wrong direction. And uh, for college educated whites, the wages have grown four times faster than they have grown for uh, black uh, workers during those years. And not that wage growth has been fast for anybody, but um, it has been notably faster for. Um, uh, white and Hispanic families compared to black families. And why is an epidemiologist talking to you about racial wealth gap? Um, it's because it is linked to life expectancy. Um, so kind of taking it back. So this is from a Robert Wood Johnson obstacles to health report. And what you can see is that for men and for women, life expectancy at age 25 is highly coordinated, correlated with um, where you sit on the percentage of federal poverty level. So you can see, um, you know, with each small, with each incremental increase in um, uh, income, you can expect more uh, life years. And poor adults are five times as likely as those with incomes over 400% uh, of the federal poverty level to report being in poor or fair health. So um, that's from the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey, where we just so the CDC asks people, you know, a representative sample across the country, like, to rate their health. And that's one of the few, like, comprehensive measures we have about how, how healthy people are. Um, and so, you know, people report better health when they're wealthier and they uh, live longer. Um, and so it's pretty, pretty clear that there's a strong correlation here. So the things that are driving these uh, uh, disparities in wealth are also driving disparities in health. Um, so... Switching gears a little bit to transportation here. Um, this is the General Motors City of the Future from the 1939 World Fair. And you can see it was a, it was a vision that they created and um, put forth of, you know, these you know, like dense metropolis cities and then these like, you know, super highways that would zoom you out to the suburbs where your house would be. And, um, you know, it would kind of create the the ideal the ideal life, and they, um, and it's been a really like captivating type of uh, image. And I think to a lot of to a large extent, many cities are still designing um, their cities and neighborhoods and highways based on this general vision. Um, and in Seattle, you know, like after the thirty nine World's Fair, you can see that pretty quickly um, the the streetcar. Um, uh, services that were available in Seattle were, were shut down. And a few years after this kind of General Motors city of the future vision, um, we had given, we had uh, closed the last streetcar and had moved on to a sort of a, the auto auto age in the United States. And so now I'm on to the yellow. So we did green, uh, we did red, and now we're on to yellow. Um, the 1955 yellow book was a sort of an engineering handbook that showed where the um, where highways would be built in the United States, essentially. There was um, 
originally published by the Bureau of Public Roads, which is sort of the predecessor of our um, department, of, our current Department of Transportation, in the mid-century, um, mid um, 19th century, uh, they invested 425 billion in the national interstate highway system. And they gave that money to cities um, with the stipulation that the cities didn't have any say over where the um, highways would be built. So you can, you can have this money, but you have to build a highway that we, like we said, you should. And what happened with the way these highways were actually constructed were you know, in some places, um, like in New York, in the Soho, Little Italy, Lower East Side neighborhoods, um, powerful um, sort of communities were be able to organize and stop the construction of um, some of these highways. But in, you know, lower power groups, you know, like Black neighborhoods, like Black Bottom and Paradise Valley in Detroit, didn't have that power and were torn down. And this was seen as kind of an urban renewal. So some people, some City planners at the time saw this as an opportunity to sort of get rid of the parts of the city they they didn't like, and those parts of the city were, you know, largely like low income and minority areas, and in some places not even low income but just minority areas. And so this is kind of the what the 1955 uh, route um, looked like for Seattle, and I'm sure you can all name these roads. Um, because you know was largely successful, and this is kind of how the, our highway system was built. Um, and kind of fast forwarding to today, um, you know, there's there's still disparities in how we are investing in transportation and what the outcomes are. So I recently read Ride of Way by Angie Smith, and she does a great job of kind of discussing the um, the disparities of you know bicycle and pedestrian fatalities. And so she talked about Portland, you know, Portland is famous for investing in their pedestrian infrastructure. But, you know, although just over one fourth of Portlanders reside in East Portland, about half of all pedestrian deaths occur there. And out of the total traffic deaths in Portland in 2018, about 70% were in East Portland. So a quarter of the uh, population, but 70% of the traffic deaths. And uh, Portland is a predominantly white city, but more than half, 57% of East Portland residents identify as being Hispanic, Black, Asian, Native American, or multiracial. So even in areas of like progressive uh, roadway design, we are still seeing a disinvestment in uh, low income and minority neighborhoods. And uh, even, even, when, even in uh, scenarios of an abundance of investment. So, um, and this is important now because we are seeing some, you know, significant trail off in our progress towards uh, target zero or reducing pedestrian uh, fatalities, pedestrian. And, um, and this is from, this is data from Washington State, from the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. So you can kind of see around 2013, 2014, we just started going off course. And there's a number of reasons for that, but I'll point to two major ones. One um, that people are probably aware of is distracted driving. So people are using devices and cell phones and our computers um, and uh, making mistakes and it's causing, you know, costing people with their lives. But another um, less well known issue is that, you know, we've been making sort of a transition from the sedan to the SUV and SUVs are, are heavier and they're also taller. So instead of um, being hit uh, in the legs by a Corolla and kind of toppling over the um, hood, people are hit in the chest by a Toyota RAV4 and, uh, and die. And that's kind of the two of the major um, safety changes that have kind of led to, you know, the people think are leading to this um, issue. And But most of the communication around it, like, um, I saw the city of uh, Edmonds is giving away like high vis vests to um, pedestrians. Like it's sort of a, there's kind of a blame the victim issue. You're like, couldn't possibly be the cars and the drivers. It's definitely the pedestrians, you know, fault that they're uh, dying out in the streets. So I think it's an, an interesting dynamic. They were kind of, you know, and we also know that those people who are most likely to die are, you know, low income or homeless um, and in a minority or low income neighborhood, you know with, you know, underinvestment and things like traffic lights and crosswalks and all those things. Um, so this, uh, the, the way we have invested in uh, transportation historically and now uh, is still, you know, is contributing to um, these uh, health disparities and sort of these 
differences in life expectancy. And so, although like in the last slide, I showed you that uh, pedestrian bicycle fatalities were up, um, this is a chart by the CDC of up among whom. So you can see it is higher for everybody, but it was all, you know, it is disproportionately higher for black and non-Hispanic groups. And it's, you know, even, uh, even at the even now that it is where it's worse, it's not as bad for uh, white people as it has always been for black people. So the um, uh, so the disparity is is persistent over time. And the studies show that pedestrian crashes are four times more frequent in poor neighborhoods, and that neither age of the population, education, English language fluency, or population density explain the effect of poverty. So. Um, we had a, yeah, so there's a number of, of issues here. And so one of the, th one of the points I want to like, uh, sort of reinforce is that, you know, the choices we made about investing in housing and making loans, you know, uh, during the redlining era is still impacting, you know, where, what, uh, what, demographics look like today, what property values look like today, and subsequently what um, health outcomes look like today. And it's similar with transportation. So the transportation investments we made, um, you know, have determined where it is safe to, to walk and ride a bike um, today. And, and although it was, you know, built in an unjust way that disproportionately impacted um, low-income and minority areas, it is still disproportionately impacting low-income and minority areas in terms of um, uh, fatalities. And the fatalities are just the tip of the iceberg for, you know, uh, you know, injuries and, you know, just general fear of going outside in your neighborhood. So bringing these two concepts together a little bit, um, we see that moderate income housing and households in Washington state spend 63% of their uh, income on housing plus transportation. And so you, you hear a lot about housing costs, but you know, like housing costs are high in Seattle, um, but transportation costs are relatively low. So you kind of have the drive till you qualify concept, you know, where you like go further out from the big city until you can afford the house, but then your transportation costs come up. So you come up, so you don't necessarily um, reduce your cost by as much as you might hope. So HUD targets, you know, 45% of monthly income as a baseline for housing and transportation costs. And we're a long way from there and sort of moving in the, in the wrong direction. So kind of taking housing and transportation aside, I'm going to move into a different topic. Um, but another one that sort of uh, emphasizes how history impacts our health today. So um, every cell in your body has enough DNA that if you unwound it and strung it out, it would be about six feet long. Um, and then it gets wound up um, into nucleosomes and chromatins and into chromosomes. And so they're kind of tightly wound in there. Um, and then you've got this uh, methylation, um, this DNA methylation, which is sort of like the, the um, I don't know, the glossary uh, to the chrom to the to your DNA. It's like where it kind of shows where, what part of this am I going, you know, the, um, is going to be expressed, in, you know, in a, in a phenotype as opposed to just a code for, for something. So it, it affects, you know, it, this methylation kind of helps you understand how um, the same uh, DNA can make heart cells and brain cells and skin cells, um, even though they all have the same code in there. Um, but epigenetics is, you know, uh, these epigenetic factors can also be influenced by the environment. And so I saw a great example of, uh, you know, talking about epigenetics in terms of like, of music. So this is the, um, the musical score for Fantasia. And you can see that, um, you know, the, the notes never change. It's always going to be Fantasia. But the musician here made a lot of notes about how they were going to play that uh, that set of data. And so that's sort of what epigenetics is. It's like, how are how are your genes going to be played in this life you are living? And what and who writes that code? Who writes, who makes the scratches on the on the score? And um, and it's in many ways your environment. So the agouti gene in mice is a good example, good clear example of if you take, you know, sort of these agouti mice that are um, 
uh, overweight and uh, generally unhealthy and provide no dietary supplementation, they will mostly create more agouti mice, but occasionally create healthier um, uh, you know, phenotypes. But if you supplement them uh, with additional methyl groups, uh, like changing their environment, they will express the genes differently. So this, in both scenarios, the, the genes are the same, but the, the expression of the genes are different based on this environmental factor of the diet. Um, so we know a lot more about epigenetics in rats than we do in people because their uh, generations are faster and we can test them in ways that you can't test people. And so what we know about humans is, is uh, less clear. But one of the things, some of the things you know, do know is that diet, nutrition, pollution, stress, all these things can have an impact on, um, on genes and how they're methylated. And so this is an example of like, you know, when you have, we'll call it the generation one, the grandma. So grandma is pregnant, um, has the daughter who also has the cells, uh, or the egg cells in the in her uterus, like in utero. And so three generations of, uh, of that family are being exposed to those, uh, those diet stress, you know, those, the diet, the nutrition, the pollution, the stress experienced by that grandma. And so um, looking at it historically, you know, the, the people who were experiencing the stress of the, you know, the neighborhoods that were being torn down to make way for the highway system or, you know, unable to get loans because they were in a red line, the district. And then the, the pollution of the roadways we put in, like all of those effects from that time are still being expressed in people today. And, you know, epigenetics is, a, is an evolving field of public health. So the, our under, you know, the, the certainty with which I can say that, you know, those, that that pathway is really driving um, disease outcomes today is, is relatively small, but it does, you know, there's the biological plausibility is being established. The, um, uh, the research is getting better on the, on the path, on the individual pathways. And um, uh, so there's been good um, research done on air pollution, impacting methylation, um, or, yeah, and same with uh, psychological stress and lead exposure. So air pollution, you know, is highly associated with our transportation and housing systems. Um, uh, psychological stress is a component of racism, you know, and lead exposure is mostly driven by, you know, lead dust in houses and, uh, you know, low, you know, uh, uh, older houses that are in low-income neighborhoods in city centers are where you have the most lead exposure. And that's also, those are traditionally, you know, uh, more inhabited by minorities. And you see that in the lead ex uh, exposure data. And so some of the outcomes associated with these um, could be cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, and preterm birth. And what you can kind of see is that for these, um, that it sort of checks out in terms of the disease rates as well. So our Cardiovascular disease rates are worse in, you know, hypertension prevalence, uh, breast cancer rates um, are about the same, but breast cancer mortality is different. Um, Preterm birth, low birth weight, infant mortality, all these things are known to have, you know, show, have epigenetic factors, you know, especially more clearly demonstrated in mice, but it seems like it might um, be true in humans as well, and it's related to these sort of uh, these sort of uh, social determinant of health constellation we've been talking about. You know, your housing matters um, for your health, and it might matter for a long time. And same with uh, you know the transportation and uh, and stress issues. And so you aren't going to get out of a presentation by an epidemiologist this day and age without a few slides on COVID-19. So you might not be surprised that there are also uh, racial disparities in um, the incidence and fatality rates of um, for, from COVID-19 by race. So um, you know, white people are 60% of the population, but only 50% of the deaths and only 44% of the cases, whereas black people are 12% of the population, but 21% of the deaths. And I can tell you in Washington state that the white black disparity is not as pronounced, but the white Hispanic disparity is, is even more pronounced. So in Washington state, um, 
that that disparity is very um, very clear. And you can go to like our COVID dashboards and look around at that and see what it looks like in your your county or area. Um, but I also wanted to note, you know, you know, we talked about transportation and the impact on pollution. Um, and COVID-19 also seems to be impacted by pollution. So COVID is um, respiratory disease and air pollution is also a respiratory stressor. So there's a theory that, you know, um, potentially having that additional respiratory stress could put you at a greater chance of death. So this study found a, you know, a small increase in long-term PM 2.5 is associated with an 11% increase in a in county level COVID mortality rate. So, so I don't want you to go out and think that like air pollution is really the thing you need to deal with if you want to do it. It's still the things you need to do for COVID are still, you know, wear your mask, socially distance and have good ventilation and stay within your bubble. Um, but, you know, on a, on a broad scale, air pollution is uh, having an impact as well. So here's our uh, three year average PM 2.5 in Washington state, if you're curious, you can kind of guess it sort of centers around the population centers. Um, so a lot of this was sort of depressing. Um, and so I'm going to talk about opportunities. And one of the, the main thing I want to say about the opportunities is the, the bad news is that the bad choices that we made a long time ago are still visible in our, you know, our housing infrastructure today and our um, uh, transportation infrastructures today and in our, you know, genetic expression of our own bodies today. Um, so that's, that's the bad news. But the good news is that the, the choices we make to make things better um, today could also have those impacts many generations into the future. So uh, right now we sort of have an opportunity um, to change a lot of our infrastructure for a number of reasons. A major one is climate change. So the governor is uh, dedicated to um, updating our infrastructure and having you know a clean energy grid, a clean transportation grid, and clean housing grid. And it's an opportunity to uh, make investments in those systems that work against some of the uh, historical like uh, institutional racism that was built into those those infrastructures. So in 2019, the legislature commissioned this environmental justice task force report um, that was just published last fall. And I read you the definition of environmental justice from this report. And oops, uh, what our, the Department of Health's role in the report was to create this environmental health disparities map um, or one of our roles. And it kind of rolls up uh, environmental exposures, environmental effects, socioeconomic factors and sensitive populations uh, to get a sense of where where people are experiencing environmental health disparities. Um, this is a list of all the um, data that went into that map and that, that gets rolled up. Uh, I won't go through each of them. Um, and you might not be surprised that like as, so the one is the lowest environmental you know, health disparities and the 10 is the highest. And so you might not be surprised that as you go from a one to a 10, you see a sort of a linear decrease in the proportion of um, white people in those census tracts and an increase in, you know, black, Native American, uh, multiracial, and Hispanic Latino populations. Uh, you can see this last one is the state average here. Uh, and you can see a similar, you know, linear trend in life expectancy. So the difference between living in a census tract with a you know, the ranks of one uh, for environmental health disparities is about five years longer than one that ranks a 10. So we had these opportunities, um, you know, to you know, we talked a lot about transportation and uh, housing, and we are making, you know, and those also just happen to be the biggest uh, emitters in Washington State of greenhouse gas emissions. So the governor is investing a lot of money and a lot of political capital in improving the, uh, reducing the carbon uh, intensity of our transportation system and our homes and buildings. Um, and in our and in our energy systems, and it's an opportunity to um, sort of invest in more in a more equitable society. So not only so there's some hope here. Like not only do you get to sort of work against the um, racist policies of the past, but you also get to um, stop uh, you know the worst effects of climate change. You know some of them are baked in, but you get a chance to stop the worst effects. And in the process, you get to build a healthier society. So these are some of the priorities that are out of the governor's budget. 
Um, uh, I'm going to touch that one later. But then there's also um, some legislation coming through this uh, session. So I just want to quote Representative Saldana. She said, because we can only achieve our climate goals by leading with environmental and racial justice, I am encouraged to see codifying environmental justice and fully funding the office of equity are prioritized in the governor's budget rollout. Um, and, and more than that is happening. So there's the HEAL Act um, defines and commits state agencies to adopting a mission of environmental justice. And not just the Department of Health, but the, you know, the Department of Transportation, um, the Department of Commerce, um, all of them you know, under this act would potentially uh, be uh, forced to like adopt this mission and sort of change to sort of start working together to address these issues. Um, there's also a clean fuel standard, uh, which would reduce air pollution near roadways and target investment in electric vehicles uh, infrastructure in highly impacted communities. Um, and there's also the zero emissions transportation bill um, and the Climate Commitment Act, which is a cap and invest bill that would eventually generate up to a billion dollars in revenue per biennium and would invest strategically in highly impacted communities. Um, and then 1084, works on decarbonizing buildings and requires um, utilities to do uh, resource planning based on the, that uh, mapping tool I showed you. So um, there's some hope to be had there, but I also sort of wanted to take a look at this um, Department of Transportation's Automated Vehicles Comprehensive Plan and just kind of show you that, you know, it looks a lot like you know, the General Motors 1939 World Fair, but just like the zoomed in view. So there are, there are competing visions for what the future of the, you know, transportation should look like and same with housing and same with um, public health. And so uh, the, the difference is gonna be um, people engaging in the process and um, uh, sort of working towards a, you know, a, a healthier, greener future. And so I have a few things you can do. I don't, uh, I, as a state government employee, I can't be particularly um, deep in the advocacy thing, but I can say, go check your deed and see if there's any racial covenants. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. It also will make you figure out where your deed is, which is what I had to do. Um, and then go to a local meeting. Like you could be like those, you know, historical um, uh, community members of Soho that saved it from being uh, plowed over by a highway. Um, and you can do that for your community. I'm not trying to say you should all be NIMBYs, but maybe about highways, that's fine, um, <laughs> in my opinion. And then just engage in how, you know, your cities and counties have housing policies and transportation policies and climate policies. So go to, go to one meeting and learn more about it. And like, you know, maybe comment at the public meeting section and let them know what, what you want to see in your community going forward. And so that uh, long last is all I have for you tonight. Um, if there are any questions, please let me know. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see you all again. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rad. That was fascinating. I was, I have obviously spoken with you about this topic prior to this program. And yet I'm still like, pulling at the threads that you're kind of like making the connections from our past to the present. And there's just so many deep dives that you can take in all of these different ways. So you did, you did such a great job of giving an overview of it. Thank you so much. Um, we did have a few questions. Um, we had Diane who asked, first of all, does anyone know where that specific location is in Tacoma that you had mentioned um, in the deeds? I don't even know how to say it, but Oregon Manor. And I don't know where that is. Do you know where that's located? Yeah, it's sort of like north of the port. So um, let me, uh, I'm blanking on the name, Segregated Seattle. So there is a, University of Washington did this project called Segregated Seattle, where they looked through all the deeds and all the Seattle neighborhoods. Um, and they kind of went down to like North Portland is, is kind of as far as they got. And you can go, they've got an interactive map where you can go see where all the racially, racial covenants are. Um, and it was a really cool project, but it only covered Seattle, you know, down to North Portland. So um, there's been a few op-eds in Olympia, you know, where I am about like where these are and, you know, the rest of Tacoma, Spokane, you know, Vancouver, 
you know, we just need people just need to go read their read their deeds and and you know undo it. You know, it's it's like it's like the it's like the it's like a very personal version of taking down the um, you know um, you know monuments to uh, uh, you know Confederate generals and that that sort of thing. If if you're into that, so um, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and it. It does appear that that work is continuing across the state. And actually, I'm going to put a link in the chat right now um, because Diane also had the question, like, are people still working on this in Tacoma? She had heard about a number of people in the North End that were working to make sure that that language was removed. And it looks like um, there's a whole page dedicated to this on Pierce County's auditor page looking specifically at restrictive covenants. So defining what that means, and then also taking you step by step to check yours and have that language removed. So that work is so absolutely still happening. Thanks, Diane. And let's see, lots of thank yous, lots of like, this is all very eye-opening. Um, I know that I've had a lot of conversations with people that said like, but how can like health despair, like how can COVID-19 actually be, impacted because of decisions made before. And you made so many interesting, compelling arguments. Just looking at that short video too about the central district and the redlining and those neighborhood covenants and like actually physically seeing that in the mapping as you continue to point out. Um, do you wanna walk us a little bit more through the, uh, the Washington environmental health disparities map because that is a very interesting deep dive. Maybe describe a little bit more about like the overlaying features that you can look at there. Sure. Um, so I've been thinking about this map a lot recently um, because <laughs> um, we were. See, I got to get my keyboard back in front of me. Um, and I do have to warn people, you're going to be like into this map for a little while. Like once you get going in it, you're like, how does this relate to this? And it's just like very amazing to see all of this information overlaid in this way. So this is our Washington tracking network. Are you, can you see my screen? Have I, did I share my screen? No. Oh. Glad I checked. Um, There, there we, we go. go. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is our Washington Tracking Network site, and this is our information by location map. Um, and I'm just going to click these things to make it bigger. And so this is we have a number of maps here, um, but I'm going to focus on this one here, the environmental health disparities, version 1.1. And you know, I thought it was interesting. The person who asked, like, you know, COVID is so new. How can um, how do we know that you know, like, how can there already be disparities around it? Um, and I and I think um, it's an interesting question. And we were sort of asked it to look into a similar question for you know climate change impact. So there was a bill two sessions ago that charged the Department of Health with um, identifying communities that would be highly impacted by climate change and. We, we actually, after going around in circles a bunch of times, landed back here. We were like, you know, it is always the same community. So there's always, you know, it is always this, you know, low socioeconomic status. It's always educational outcomes. You know, it's always the people who are already experiencing pollution and other forms um, that are going to be the most impacted. So what we, what we did instead was added information about what types of climate impacts they might expect, but we didn't make any changes to who we thought would be impacted. So um, I'm going to do my best to zoom into the um, uh, census track that that manner was in, just because somebody else about it. So I'm going to somewhere around here. I'm going to get like right on the edge of federal way here. So you you can click on a census track, and it sort of shows you where it ranks. So it ranks a 10 on environmental exposures, a 9 on environmental effects seven on socioeconomic factors and the six on sensitive populations. But each of these are expandable. So when it ranks a 10 for environmental exposures, that's a roll up of uh, diesel emission, ozone concentration, PM 2.5 concentration, populations near heavy traffic roadways, and toxic release from facilities. So you these, these five roll up into this. Um, so you can be like, okay, so that's, 
it ranks a 10 because you know it ranks high in all except for ozone it like doesn't rank high in ozone but it ranks a 10 because it ranks high in the rest of them then we have environmental effects you know lead risk from housing proximity to hazardous waste treatment uh, storage and disposal facilities um, socioeconomic factors um, so ranks high in limiting English proficiency, uh, but not so high in unemployment um, or transportation expense. So um, you can kind of you can kind of get you know. And then down here we've got some of the demographic uh, data. So you can see sixty percent white, six percent multi race, thirteen percent Hispanic, fourteen percent Asian. Um, and we see the population trends over time. Um, and then you have sensitive populations, which is death from cardiovascular disease and low birth weight. So you can see it ranks, doesn't rank particularly high in cardiovascular disease, but it does rank higher in low birth weight. And um, so that's kind of how all these roll together. And then this, yeah, you can add, um, so if you want to like, oh, where is Tacoma? So I can click here and like, oh, here's the city of Tacoma or, um, you can look at tribal land boundaries. Um, so this is the Puyallup tribe. Um, you can pull up zip codes, 100-year um, flood zones, prisons, um, toxic release sites. And you can kind of get some information about them. So there's a ton in here. And uh, all this data is downloadable. So if you're like, you know, if you're like me and like the PM 2.5 is like a big deal, um, you can click on this. It'll take you back to this page. It'll tell you, you know, where the data came from, so you can kind of track it back to its source. Um, and then uh, it catches up with me. Um, you can download the data yourself, so you can just download a CSV file. With, um, Yeah, so here's the export button. And um, if you are a data nerd like me, you can, um, it's gonna open in the other key. Um, it's got the PM2.5 concentration and the, um, and the IBL rank, and you can just kind of run from it from there and do, do whatever you want. So, um, and, well, it's just amazing when you start to think about at the beginning of the program, you had mentioned you had like the pie chart that actually showed like the different impacts on health. So that included um, the fact that social and economic factors de determine 55% of health outcomes and then also like environment and how that impacts that. So when you start like really digging deep into these maps and looking at all of this data kind of overlaying, it's really amazing the fact that you can already predict who is going to be impacted by things like forthcoming climate change based on all of these decisions that have been made in the past is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you were right that once you get me on that map, I will go on and on for a while. So um. <laughs> it's impossible not to, right? Like you just like want to keep digging deeper. Like, what does this mean? How does this relate to this? And you can see it all right there. Yeah. And that the slide you mentioned that kind of shows, you know, like 55% of our health outcome is determined by, you know, as an epidemiologist, I almost can't use that slide. Like people use that slide for years and I would fight with them um, because the the attribution map is just, it is just hard to say what, you know, in mass is responsible for all the deaths in the United States and what, what caused them all and like with any sort of certainty. So um, it took me a number of years, like coming around to like, you know, the it, it's it's more of like a, you know, like they did do an attempt to quantify it, but it's more like a term of art. Like we know that it's big. We know these social and environmental factors are big. We know healthcare is, you know, smaller than, you know, disproportionately small compared to how much is invested in it. Um, and that is enough. And so um, it's been one of those like, um, they say kill your darlings. Like using that slide has been an example of me killing my darlings so that I could like tell a better story because it's one of the things that you know epidemiologists don't do sometimes because we try we are too 
<laughs> finicky with data. And um, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I did that tonight too, but I'm, I'm better than I used to be. You should have seen. Me. No, I think that was an appropriate use of data and just the right amount. And speaking of data, um, Jonathan had a question. Have you noticed any disparities in Washington State that do not mirror national trends? That is a good question. So I think the one that I mentioned today is uh, like, if you look at our COVID-19 dashboard, um, you know, we definitely see the disparity between um, white and Hispanic Latino um, populations for COVID-19, but we don't see as much for um, black populations. And that could potentially just be because we have a relatively small black population in Washington state. So like when the numbers are small, the, the estimates are not as, Certain, but but that is one one place where we've we've been different. Um, Washington is in general healthier than um, most other states. Um, I think Colorado like is the healthiest state, uh, but Washington we're like in the top ten, you know, like somewhere around Minnesota or something, you know. Um, and so we don't have some of the major health disparities you see in some of places where like diabetes and heart disease are like much bigger issues than they are here. Not that they aren't big issues here, but you know. Um, relative to other states in the nation, we don't have those same the same intensity of chronic disease um, issues. You know, not to say that for individuals, those diseases aren't aren't just as terrible here as they are anywhere else. Absolutely. So I'm curious, just based on the fact that there seems like there are so many different issues to tackle when it comes to this, and like planning and thinking ahead. One thing that is reassuring is like, instead of putting all of the emphasis into the health department and saying that you're all working on health, this is getting kind of spread out into all of these other agencies that are responsible for things like transportation, commerce, that's reassuring at least. But what would be kind of um, your main focus in the coming years? What do you think that you'll be kind of advocating, not advocating because we can't do that as a state agency, but what what will you be pushing towards that you think will make the greatest health impacts? Um, that's a good question. My One of the things that, uh, so we're on the precipice of making massive investments in um, reducing our carbon emissions. Um, and one thing that I'm focused on in my climate and health role is making sure we're communicating clearly to leadership the health, impl impl the health implications of the different choices they can make in order to do that. So there are a number of different ways to decarbonize the economy. Some of them are better for health than others. So like uh, this legislative session, I wrote a letter um, to the legislature about the Clean Fuels Act because um, we know that people living near roadways are, you know, lower income and minority and already experiencing health disparities. We know that um, uh, people who live near these roadways have shorter lifespans um, just from the cumulative effect across, you know, millions of lives of um, that additional, you know, air pollution. And so by, so, uh, and we also know from California that is done the clean fuels standard that like many fewer people die from air pollution exposure when you start cleaning up fuels and you're improving health disparities because you're doing it in these high population centers, you know, and that is a great way to decarbonize the economy. Um, you know, planting trees in Eastern Washington is spectacular. Like carbon sinks are amazing. Um, you definitely, it is definitely a great carbon strategy, but um, there, you know, if you have a million dollars to invest and you get the same benefit in terms of carbon reduction from clean fuels as you are from planting trees, the clean fuels is going to lead to a healthier society. Not that you can't do both, not anti-tree planting, <laughs> but um, but making sure that people understand the different, uh, you know, the, the health implications of their choices as they decarbonize, because there's a huge opportunity to not just decarbonize the economy, but to make us a healthier society. Right, and that's all based on the fact that you have all of that data from over decades of people living near these roadways and actually seeing this kind of play out in terms of health. And again, like you had mentioned, um, you know, the certain percentages of income that go towards housing and transportation. We know certain people get pushed out of certain areas because they can't afford, they're closer to 
certain types of roadways to then take the certain types of transportation. So you just kind of start pulling at that thread a little bit more and you start again to see how all of these are related. Mm -hmm. But I'm excited to hear that there are these opportunities moving forward, thinking about how transportation can really positively impact health outcomes in the future. And people are ready to hear about it, having seen all of these maps data over time. It's pretty incredible. So any final words for us where we don't have any more questions, but any final thoughts for us this evening? Uh, I just want to yeah, say thanks to everybody who took the time uh, to listen to me. Uh, if you come up with questions that you did not think of right now or have other things you want to engage with me about, uh, send me an email. Like I said, you know, Public Health 3.0 is about building relationships and, um, you know, working across sectors. And so, if, you know, if, if you want to do that with me or you see an opportunity based on something I said, um, reach out and let's see what we can do. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I'm excited that you are interested in diving into that history with us, which I know is kind of unique for you. So we super appreciate your time, talent, and expertise in joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Molly. And just a little plug. I want to, first of all, make sure that we thank Columbia Bank for sponsoring our Washington Stay Home Society programming, making it possible. But I also want to point out that Downtown On The Go is doing ongoing talks about transportation and the relationship to race. So their next talk is going to be on February 26th, Racism and Transportation Policy, Can Street Safety Be Anti-Racist? That is from noon to 1 p.m. online. And you can go to downtownonthego.com to learn more about their organization as well as learn more about all of their upcoming events and programs. And look, there's the whole history museum in there. <laughs> Love seeing it. But again, thank you for joining us for the Washington Stay Home Society series and for this program, Challenging History, Racism, and City Development's Impact on Washington's Health Today. Um, to see what we have coming up next, go ahead and visit our website, the Washington Stay Home Society series page. Link is right there. And if you enjoyed the program, please do consider donating to help us continue bringing you this virtual programming. And also, if you're interested in becoming a member to support the Washington State Historical Site in an ongoing way, that information is on that link as well. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you next week for Dr. Daude Abe's program about hip hop in uh, Seattle. So join us then. Thank you all so much.